All right, so good evening. Thanks to those of you who are joining live and those of you who are watching the recording. I appreciate it. My name is Dr. Josh Franco, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Cuyamaca College in East San Diego County, California. Welcome to our workshop on global conflict and cooperation, uh, summer 2022 edition. So this workshop is a series that's focused on defining, exploring, and discussing how global conflict and cooperation um, from the point of view of different international institutions, country governments, and international non-governmental organizations. Our schedule for the workshops have been the following. So our first one of this summer was Summit of the Americas, and then the following week we talked about Ukraine. Last week we talked about the oceans, and then today we'll be talking about NATO. So let's go ahead and jump to NATO and go from there. So week four, NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Here you see a, a picture of a map of the North Atlantic. On the left-hand side, you see the eastern part of the United States and Canada, uh, Iceland, and then the European countries that are members, including Norway, United Kingdom, Poland, Turkey, <coughs> Spain, Portugal. So our learning objectives with this workshop are the following. First is, uh, by the end of this workshop, you'll be able to identify NATO. Secondly, is to explain how conflict has shaped NATO. Third is to explain how NATO facilitates cooperation. And then lastly, describe, how, describe the current implications of NATO expansion. So a little bit about NATO. We're going to check out their website. And they have a pretty cool webpage. I'll post the link in the chat. So what is NATO? So we'll talk about some member countries, basic points, their activities, key events, and working structures. So first with their member countries, uh, there are currently 30 members of NATO, and we can either sort them alphabetically. So from Albania, Belgium, Bulgaria, all the way through uh, Turkey, uh, the United Kingdom, and the United States. We can also sort it by date. So Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, United Kingdom, and the United States were the founding members of NATO. And then as time has gone on, other countries have ascended to and become members of NATO. <clears throat> what are some basic points about NATO itself? Well, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is primarily a political and military alliance. And so on the political front, NATO promotes de democratic values and enables members to consult and cooperate on defense and security related issues to solve problems, build trust, and in the long run, prevent conflict. And on the military side, NATO is committed to a peaceful resolution of disputes. If diplomatic efforts fail, it has the military power to undertake crisis management operations. These are carried out under the collective defense clause of the NATO's founding treaty, Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, or under the United Nations mandate alone or in cooperation with other countries and international organizations. Additionally, NATO provides for the collective defense. So the idea is that an attack on any one of those 30 members would be an attack on all of the members. And so they will they form a defensive pact, which will respond uh, if any members are um, aggressively engaged by other countries. The next point is that it's a transatlantic link. So this uh, spans the North Atlantic, uh, United States and Canada, all the way to um, the heart of Europe. And then lastly, <clears throat> their most uh, recent uh, strategic concept. So strategic concepts lay down the alliance's core tasks and principles, its values and evolving security environment, and the alliance's strategic objectives for the next decade. And we're going to click on this to kind of show you that it's pretty fascinating to know that there's a, obviously a, a defensive pact, a treaty, and they're pretty <laughs> transparent about what they're trying to do. Uh, so they talk about their strategic concepts. Uh, they have their report here, which we can download. Go ahead and open this up. Check out the uh, structure of it really quick. So here's their strategic concept paper or working document gives a preface talks about what they're doing their purpose and principles the strategic environment in which they're operating which includes almost two dozen planks their core task of deterrence and defense crisis prevention and management cooperative security and then onwards with other parts of it 
So this is online, like 30 countries saying this is how we're going to work together to provide for a collective defense in the face of any aggression. Next, we have the activities of NATO. So they have decisions and consultations. So every day, member countries consult and take decisions on security issues at all levels uh, and in a variety of fields. Secondly, they have operations and missions. So things like including Kosovo, securing the Mediterranean, supporting the African Union. They maintain partnerships with international organizations and uh, developing the means to respond to threats. So having not only the policies, right, things in writing, but the capabilities and the structures to do that. Um, so, for example, if you're trying to maintain a defensive posture in Eastern Europe, you can't just say, let's do that. You have to have a lot of uh, political and military uh, engagement uh, across different governments and across different uh, organizational leadership structures and uh, logistical and a whole range of other things. Uh, some key events in NATO's history include the birth of NATO and during the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, which at the time was partitioning Eastern and Western Germany. In 1991, NATO developed partnerships with former adversaries of the uh, what's called the Eastern Bloc. By 1995, NATO emerges as the first major crisis management operation in Bosnia uh, Herzegovina. Govina. In 2001, um, NATO had to invoke Article 5 because there was an attack on the United States. In 2003, NATO took command of the International Security Assistance Force, or the ISAF, in Afghanistan. And in 2022, NATO has adopted its strategic concepts going forward. Next, you have some working structures. So the member countries are always the, the kind of governing board or body. And then you have NATO delegations, Nuclear Planning Group, and the North Atlantic Council. And under them, you have uh, committees. Here you have military representatives. So there's a military committee. You have a secretary general, which serves as like the bureaucratic hub of NATO. Under the military committee itself, you have inter international military staff and allied command operations and allied command transformation. So an integrated military command structure. So that's a... Pretty broad overview of NATO. So it's key to point out that NATO is made up of members of countries or country governments. Uh, there's 30 of them, like we mentioned a moment ago, and there are 12 founding members. So with respect to conflict, we'll look at this from like a historical perspective and then the contemporary perspective. So I'll pull up this link on why NATO was uh, founded. And we'll go ahead and have this video played. Let me make sure the sound's working. It should be. So go ahead. Along with this. If you can give a thumbs up that you can hear, that'd be great. The North Atlantic Alliance was founded in the aftermath of the Second World War. Its purpose was to secure peace in Europe, to promote cooperation among its members, and to guard their freedom. All of this in the context of countering the threat posed at the time by the Soviet Union. The Alliance's founding treaty was signed in Washington in 1949 by a dozen European and North American countries. It commits the Allies to democracy, individual liberty and the rule of law, as well as to peaceful resolution of disputes. Importantly, the treaty sets out the idea of collective defense, meaning that an attack against one ally is considered as an attack against all allies. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, ensures that the security of its European member countries is inseparably linked to that of its North American member countries. The organization also provides a unique forum for dialogue and cooperation across the Atlantic. The alliance started with 12 member countries in 1949. However, the founding treaty allows for other European nations to join the alliance, as long as all existing allies agree. Any prospective member must share NATO's core values and have the capacity and willingness to contribute to security in the Euro-Atlantic area. Today, NATO has 30 members who are stronger and safer together. For seven decades, NATO has ensured peace within its territory. While threats and the way NATO deals with them have evolved over time, the purpose, values and founding principles of the Alliance do not change. For its first four decades, the Cold War defined the Alliance. 
collective defense was NATO's main role. When that confrontation ended in 1989, and with the collapse of the Soviet Union, some said that NATO had fulfilled its purpose, that it was no longer needed. And yet the alliance is still here today. So why has NATO stood the test of time? The end of the Cold War offered hope for progress and peace, but it also ushered in a new era of instability. NATO has responded to changes in the security environment by shifting its focus and taking on new tasks. Beyond ensuring the collective defense of its members, NATO seeks to promote security through partnership and cooperation. So I guess a little bit of background about the historical nature of NATO's formation. The key thing to point out here is that <clears throat> um, basically NATO was a counterweight to what we call the Warsaw Pact. The Warsaw Pact was um, led by the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic or the USSR uh, following the end of World War II. And they built a block of countries that served in their mind as the counterweight to European and American power. And so these two large pacts, the Warsaw Pact and NATO, competed basically for power, prestige, uh, position in the global community and largely in uh, the European theater. And it wasn't until 1989 with the fall of the Soviet Union that um, that conflict, which we label the Cold War now, uh, came to its conclusion. So <clears throat> conflict is a part of NATO's founding. Um, and then there's other links that talks about a short history of it. And then the U.S. State Department has an office of the historian talking about that uh, time period. More contemporary conflict is the is the uh, recent invasion uh, by Russian, the Russian government of the country of Ukraine. And this really has precipitated a rapid evolution of NATO's uh, core functions. And as we'll talk about in a few moments, it's expansion with additional members uh, in Eastern Europe. So conflict, right, is serving as the root of the forming of the founding of NATO. And as we know, NATO um, is uh, kind of forged in this conflictual fire, but it also has these cooperative purposes, which we'll turn to next. So <clears throat> uh, NATO and cooperation. Let me go ahead and pull the page back up here because uh, in this video talking about uh, this cooperative element and then we'll get to the some of these other links since the early 1990s the alliance has developed relations with non-member countries including former cold war adversaries of the former eastern bloc some of these partners have since become members of the alliance today working with non-member countries and other organizations is considered to be one of nato's fundamental tasks it works with 40 partner countries, as well as with other international organizations, like the United Nations and the European Union. NATO has taken on an important role in international crisis management since the end of the Cold War. Working closely with partner countries, the Alliance helped to end war and build sustainable peace in the Balkans. In the wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the United States, allies and partners deployed forces to Afghanistan to help bring stability. During the Arab Spring, NATO led an air campaign over Libya to protect civilians being targeted by the Gaddafi dictatorship. At sea, NATO and its partners have helped to prevent piracy off the Horn of Africa and are cooperating to fight terrorism in the Mediterranean Sea. NATO has also supported international efforts to stem illegal migration and human trafficking in the Aegean Sea. Today, we face a much broader range of threats than in the past. To the east, Russia has become more assertive with the illegal annexation of Crimea and destabilization of eastern Ukraine, as well as its military buildup close to NATO's borders. To the south, the security situation in the Middle East and Africa has deteriorated causing loss of life, fueling large-scale migration flows, and inspiring terrorist attacks. NATO is responding by reinforcing its deterrence and defense posture, as well as supporting international efforts to project stability and strengthen security outside NATO territory. We are also confronted with the spread of weapons of mass destruction, 
cyber attacks and threats to energy supplies as well as environmental challenges with security implications. These challenges are too big for any one country or organization to handle on its own. So NATO is working closely with its network of partners to help tackle them. So there you hear that NATO you know, forms as this defensive pack counterweight to uh, the uh, Soviet Union. And then it enters into like this phase of what should it be still serves as this cooperative element, but there wasn't anything to counterweight against for about 20 years. <clears throat> you had some conflicts in Eastern Europe, you had intervention by NATO and other countries, it kind of like re-infused its purpose. And then NATO for the first uh, last 20 years, 15, 20 years, it's kind of been uh, there as a presence and I would say an identity crisis, but more or less like, what do we do next? Right. Because at this point, Russia was coming into like the European fold. There's going to be strong relationships uh, in greater Europe and uh, Eurasia and seemed kind of like, all right, things are good. But as uh, things have changed pretty dramatically since 9-11 and they drained even more dramatically in the past uh, year and a half uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's kind of re um, invigorated the alliance. So where are we at with cooperation? Well, first I'll point uh, this link, uh, and it's a joint statement from uh, Senators Jim Reich, uh, Arish uh, Bob Mendez, and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and Republican Leader Mitch McConnell, along with some other uh, senators, uh, where they uh, support a resolution to support Finland and Sweden's ascension to NATO. So I'm going to go ahead and play these uh, uh First couple links. Rish, Menendez, Schumer, McConnell, colleagues introduce resolution in support of Finland, Sweden joining NATO. Washington, U.S. Senators Jim Rish, Republican Idaho, and Bob Menendez, Democrat New Jersey, ranking member and chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Democrat New York, Republican Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican Kentucky, Gene Shaheen, Democrat New Hampshire, Ron Johnson, Republican Wisconsin, Ben Cardin, Democrat Maryland, and Chris Coons, Democrat Delaware, last Thursday introduced a resolution in support of Finland's and Sweden's accession to NATO. Last week, I was honored to meet President Nini Sto of Finland and Prime Minister Andersson of Sweden here at the capital. Both Finland and Sweden have been longtime friends and partners to both the United States and to NATO, and I am fully confident that their inclusion will strengthen and add new capabilities to the alliance, said ranking member Rish. To welcome their mutual decision to apply for membership in NATO, something that I have long encouraged them to do, I've introduced a bipartisan resolution with Senator Menendez and others in support of their speedy accession. This resolution highlights both nations' political and military successes and calls on the Senate to ratify their accession to NATO as soon as possible. So here you have a demonstration of domestic political support for these two new, uh, two new countries to join uh, NATO. Um, additionally, there was um, uh, just this week where NATO took another step towards finalizing the memberships of Sweden and Finland. So Let's go ahead and uh, open up that link, PBS NewsHour. <clears throat> and we'll have this uh, play for a few moments. Here's what's new this month with Passport. Do you like the car? And of course, we have an advertisement. Look at that beautiful. <laughs> oh, my heart's racing. We'll let the ad come through. Patiently waiting. There we go. Yes, app. Download it today. In the day's other news, in Ukraine, the governor of Donetsk is urging the 350,000 remaining residents to evacuate from the last eastern province that is still partly under government control as Russian troops step up their offensive. Meanwhile, a new wave of Russian shelling pounded the cities of Slovyansk and Kramatorsk, hitting residential areas and a market. We'll have more on all this later in the program. 
NATO's 30 nations signed accession protocols today for Finland and Sweden to join the alliance, but each country's legislature still needs to ratify the membership bids. Turkey's government said that it might refuse if the two countries fail to meet their demands to extradite people they perceive to be terror suspects. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg urged allies to move swiftly. So this brief uh, news report goes on to describe these kind of domestic international politics that are uh, going on with this uh, situation. But I just want to point out here that in order for countries to join NATO, they need to be approved or go through the succession process. And that needs to be ratified by each country's national Congress or national legislature. So as we saw the bipartisan statement from our congressional leaders here in the United States, you also have these other 29 member countries who have our working democracies and they have national legislatures and they have their own politics that they have to deal with and try to move this uh, accession process and approval for Finland and Sweden along. So with that, what are some of these implications? So first, uh, just today, Na uh, Canada <laughs> was the first NATO ally to ratify the membership bids of Finland and Sweden. So one down, 29 more to go for the two countries. Uh, there's also an article that talks about how Ukraine was getting a lot of attention at NATO's recent summit, uh, but that there's questions over the West's resolve and supporting the Ukraine. And then lastly is a, a clip which I'll show about President Biden at NATO announcing increased military presence in Europe. So let's go ahead and open up that link and listen to uh, about a minute, about two or three minutes uh, of this. All around this country. And of course, there's another ad. I can skip it though. Great. So here's the president with the secretary general of NATO. So he's the, the core bureaucratic bureaucrat for the alliance. Well, Jens, thank you very much uh, for having me this morning. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we got a big agenda. And uh, great to be with you to kick off the, uh, I think, is a history-making summit. And we talked about this for a year, and now we're here. Our meetings today, we're going to approve a new NATO strategic concept and uh, reaffirm the unity and determination of our alliance to defend every inch of NATO territory. And uh, Article 5 is sacrosanct, and we mean it when we say an attack against one is an attack against all, every inch. And so at this summit, uh, the full alliance is going to welcome Finland and Sweden, uh, their historic application for membership, and their decision to move away from neutrality and the tradition of neutrality to join NATO alliance is going to make us stronger and more secure, and NATO stronger. We're sending an unmistakable message, in my view, and I think yours as well, uh, that NATO is strong, united, and the steps we're taking uh, during this summit are going to further augment our collective strength. To that end, today I'm announcing the United States will enhance our force posture in Europe and respond to the changed security environment, as well as strengthening our collective security. Earlier this year, we surged 20,000 additional U.S. forces to Europe to bolster our alliance in response to Russia's aggressive move, bringing our force total in Europe to 100,000. We're going to continue to adjust our posture based on the threat in close consultation with our allies. Here in Spain, we're going to work with our ally to increase uh, U.S. Navy destroyers stationed in Spain's Rota naval base from uh, three to, uh, from four to six, uh, uh, four to six destroyers. In Poland, we're going to establish a permanent headquarters of the U.S. Fifth Army Corps and uh, strengthening our U.S. NATO interoperability across the entire eastern flank. We're going to maintain additional rotational brigade, uh, which is 3,000 fighters and another 2,000 personnel combat team here in Europe, headquartered in Romania. So the president goes on to describe basically the, the increase in U.S. presence, both uh, personnel wise and in, um, infrastructure and equipment wise uh, in Europe. This was a significant announcement by the president 
um, at the NATO summit to basically go from a couple years ago where there was like unsure that Europe was unsure, like where's the United States stand under the prior administration to uh, under this uh, presidential administration, making it very clear and definitive that uh, the United States' uh, security future in Europe uh, is um, going to be more permanent than what it was just a couple years ago. So that's one of the implications of NATO itself is that it's expansion and it's serving as a counterweight in this case to now Russian government aggression. And, you know, the question is what happens going forward? Time will tell. So with that, thanks so much for your time and attention and listening in. And uh, we'll go ahead and get to our discussion. So take care and have a great uh, evening.